Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Sallallahu wa sallam alayka ya Sayyidi wa ya Mawlaya ya Rasulallah. Sallallahu wa sallam alayka ya Sayyidi wa ya Mawlaya ya Aba Abdillah. يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ويؤثرون على أنفسهم ولو كان بهم خصاصة آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم Let us begin by enlivening our hearts and minds in our gathering with the remembrance of the Holy Prophet and his pure progeny صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد I read a story about a family who were having lunch one day over the weekend, a father, mother, and their young daughter. And as they were eating, the young daughter was sort of fidgeting around, you know, she was playing with her food. So her mother turned to her and she told her, you know, why aren't you eating? So she told her, you know that I don't like these vegetables. And like in many families, the kids and sometimes even the adults. There's certain food items, especially when it comes to vegetables, that some just don't have a taste for. So she told her, you know that I don't like these vegetables. And just like any other mother, she persisted. And she insisted on her daughter that you should eat these vegetables you'll become, you know, you'll grow up, you'll become strong. These are healthy, they're important, you have to eat them. But this young girl, she just didn't want to eat her vegetables. So the mother turns to the father and she tells him, listen, you know, please say something, do something, she's not willing to eat. So the father turns to his daughter and he tells her, listen, sweetie, you should eat your vegetables, they're good for you. Yet she doesn't accept. So he tries again, and again she rejects. She says, I don't want it. So he tells her, please, he begins to beg her. She stops for a moment. She tells him, okay, I'll eat my vegetables under one condition. So the father tells her, you know, what is this condition? Please. You know, don't tell me that you want the latest iPad. I, I can't afford it for you right now. You know, the economy isn't so great. So she said, no, no, it's not that. But I want you to promise me that if I eat my food, you'll let me do this one thing that I want to do. So the father, he says, okay, fine. As long as you eat your food, fine. So the girl, she consumes her food. She finishes her plate. And the father is sitting there, you know, he's about his business. And then the girl, she comes to him and she tells him, I finished my plate. So now it's time for you to fulfill your promise. So he said, yeah, what is it that you want to do? She told him, I want to go and I want to shave my head bald. So the father, he said, are you serious? You're joking. She said, no. I want to go and shave my head bald. The mother heard and she was amazed. She was shocked. She said, you know, absolutely not. You're not going to do that. There's no way. So the girl, she turned to her father and she told him, you promised. You promised that if I eat my food, you would allow me to do what I want. And you've taught me not to break promises. So the father, he looks at 
his wife, the mother, he tells her she has a point. You know, we promised, we made a promise to her, and we can't break our promise, that's not right. And so reluctantly, the parents, they accept. The girl, she shaves her head bald. On the Monday, the following Monday, in the morning, the father is dropping his daughter off at school. And this is, you know, the girl is in elementary school. So the father is dropping off his daughter at school. And as he pulls into the driveway of the school, the drop-off point, you know, his daughter, she is about to leave the car. So finally, he looks at her and he says, Sweetie, are you sure you don't want to take a hat with you? Just in case. She tells him, no, I'm fine. So he says, okay. He lets her out and she begins to walk towards the entrance of the school. At this moment, the father is watching her. Suddenly, he sees another boy catch up to her, run behind her. And he reaches her and this boy is also completely bald so he thinks to himself he says I mean is this like a new trend is this the new cool thing to do the kids are you know shaving their heads bald so he makes nothing of it he says that as I was about to move suddenly someone came and knocked on my window the window of my car so I pulled down the window and it was a woman and she introduced herself to me and she said listen uh, is that your daughter there? He said, yes, that's my daughter. She told him, she told the father, she told him, let me tell you something. That boy that's walking with your daughter is my son. And recently he was diagnosed with cancer, with leukemia. And as a result of the treatment, he's lost his hair. And for the past couple of weeks, some of the children in school have been making fun of him. They've been bothering him. They've been breaking his heart. And your daughter, she's been comforting him. She's been talking to him. She's been consoling him. And just a few days ago, she promised him, she told him, I promise I'm going to make this all better for you. And he came and he told me, yet I never thought in my right mind that your daughter would go to this point where she would go and she would shave her head so that she can comfort my son, so that he would not be the only child who's being made fun of. Some individuals in this life have been endowed with a tremendous and natural capacity for empathy. They see the plight of others, they're moved by the plight of others, by the pain of others, and they seek to alleviate this pain. Some individuals have this selfless love where they place the safety and the comfort and the well-being of others before themselves. They are altruistic. Altruism or selflessness means that we place others before us. If someone is in need, then I place that person's needs before my own needs. This is the highest level of selflessness. What is known in Arabic as ithab. To be selfless means to put others before oneself. And so there are many, we see them and we hear stories all the time, yet on the other hand there are also, if we look at this world, we'll notice that there's also a great and tremendous amount of greed and selfishness. Lots of people are also very selfish. Look at the case of global poverty and deprivation. I mentioned a few nights ago that approximately 50% of the world's population lives on less than two dollars and fifty cents a day approximately half of the world's population approximately eighty percent of the world's population about 5.5 billion people live on less than ten dollars a day and some people they spend at least ten dollars just on their coffee every day but eighty percent of the global population lives 
on less than $10 a day. UNICEF, the United Nations uh, Children's International uh, Emergency Fund, the branch of you know, the United Nations that deals with the children, they estimate that on average, every single day, 22,000 children die because of poverty. 22,000 children. If you average that, that averages to about just over 15 children every minute. 15 children every minute somewhere on the face of this planet die, what? Not because of disease, not because, because of poverty, because of deprivation. Not a car accident, not any form of other uh, accidents, but what? But because of poverty, because of deprivation and they're known as invisible deaths those that are far from the scrutiny and the conscience of the world they tell us that here in the United States in the United States 46 million people 46 million people about one-sixth of the population of the United States of America lives in poverty lives in poverty, one-sixth of the U.S. population, although the United, the United States is one of the most advanced countries in the world. Yet, on the other hand, we look at our global consumption of resources, or the consumption of global resources. The United States, our population makes up 5% of the global population, Yet, we consume 33% of the world's resources. 5% of the world's population consumes one-third of the world's resources. Now, you may say, well, we have, you know, we have a, a lot of needs. A lot of it is wasted. A lot of these resources that we use are also wasted. I was reading about how much food is wasted in the United States. How much food? Since the beginning of this year, 2014, we're in what? We're on the last day of October, year 2014. Since the beginning of this year to date, Americans have wasted approximately 110 billion pounds of food. 110 billion pounds of food are what? Not consumed, are wasted. They're thrown in the garbage. Food that is edible, food that we can eat, that we can use, is thrown in the garbage. Amir al-Mu'mineen, Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says in the famous hadith, he says, wherever you see excessiveness, excessive consumption, and excessiveness, extravagance, know that there will also be excessive deprivation. If you see wastefulness on one side, know that on the other side there will be extreme deprivation. People who have nothing to eat, people who have nothing to drink, and they die, die of starvation and malnutrition. We live in a world today that promotes a me-first outlook that promotes individualism. As long as I'm okay, as long as my family's okay, as long as those around me are okay, they're happy, they're fine, it doesn't matter what happens to others. Who cares? I don't care. As long as my wife, my kids, my friends, those around me, or just myself, as long as we're doing okay, it doesn't matter what's happening in the rest of the world. I don't care about my neighbor, I don't care about my community, I don't care about anyone else. We might not necessarily say it, but through our lifestyles, through the way that we live, we notice that this sort of selfish, individualistic, me-first outlook is promoted everywhere. Many people are encouraged to do what it takes to, what, to make a quick buck, right? If we look at various activities, various business activities that go on, People are encouraged to do whatever it takes, even at the expense of others, 
to do that which, which to do what it takes in order to make an income, in order to get ahead. And so you'll notice sometimes some people, they will be deceitful in their transactions. They'll lie, right? They'll lie in order to sell something. They'll tell you it's genuine when it's not genuine. They'll tell you that it's real when it's not real. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns such individuals, those who are deceitful. Allah tells us in chapter 83, Surah Al-Mutaffifeen, وَيْلٌ لِلْمُطَفِّفِينَ Woe to those who are what? Who are fraudulent, who are deceitful in their transactions. وَيْلٌ لِلْمُطَفِّفِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا اكْتَالُوا عَلَى النَّاسِ يَسْتَوْفُونَ وَإِذَا كَالُوهُمْ أَوْ وَزَنُوهُمْ يُخْسِرُونَ When they are buying, they do what? They want to add a little bit more or pay a little bit less for more. When they are selling, they want to do the exact opposite. They want to give less for more. They're deceitful. And there are many stories that are given of individuals who would mix you know, certain grains, they would mix them with something else, right? Or milk would be mixed with water or something else. So that what? So that you can be as efficient and as effective and as profitable as possible. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيْلٌ لِلْمُطَفِّفِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا اكْتَالُوا عَلَى النَّاسِ يَسْتَوْفُونَ وَإِذَا كَالُوهُمْ أَوْ وَزَنُوهُمْ يُخْسِرُونَ أَلَا يَظُنُّ أُولَٰئِكَ أَنَّهُمْ مَبْعُوثُونَ Do these fraudulent, deceitful people, do they not think that they will be held accountable before God? لِيَوْمٍ عَظِيمٍ on a great day of accountability. And what's worse is when the selfishness is disguised with a religious excuse. You know, crime, evil is bad, but what is worse is when this crime, this bad act, when it's coded with a religious disguise, a religious excuse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Yasin, verse 47, Allah says, قَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنُطْعِمُ مَنْ لَوْ يَشَاءُ اللَّهُ أَطْعَمَهُ Shall we feed and help those who if God wanted to help them, God could have helped them. Don't you say that God is all-powerful? Don't you say that God is the source of all provision and sustenance? Well, God can give them. Why am I expected to help someone? Why am I expected to help my neighbor and those in need? God can do it. It's given a religious excuse. And this is disastrous. This is problematic. It's problematic when we are selfish, but when we are selfish with a religious excuse. And there are many examples of this. Many examples. One example that I've, I've seen, and I want to remind myself and you brothers and sisters, because sometimes we may not do certain things on purpose, but we might forget. For instance, one example is the issue of you know various Islamic centers and, and masajid around the country and elsewhere. We know that many of them, for instance, they have Ramadan programs. During the month of Ramadan, there's 30 nights of programs. Some of them, and many of them in fact, Part of their program is that they do what? They serve iftar. The program has iftar in addition to the du'as, lectures, and what have you. Now, there is great tawab in serving iftar. In feeding someone who is fasting, there is great tawab. So many of them, they do it for what? They do it for the tawab. Yet there are some individuals who will come for 30 nights or 29, depending on the moon sighting, maybe 31 sometimes, they'll come and they will consume the iftar, but they will not contribute a single dollar. Free dinner for 30 nights, but they will not contribute a single dollar. Now, we might not do this on purpose, right? We might just be there. We're thankful that we have a community. We're thankful that 
uh, you know, we have programs, but we have to be mindful. We have to think. In the end, the masjid is one that has costs. The masjid is one that needs to be taken care of financially. The masjid is one that needs volunteers and so on and so forth. So we have to be mindful of not performing certain acts that are selfish. Now, so the Qur'an tells us that in regards to selfishness and in regards to greed, in regards to thinking about ourselves and not thinking about others, pay atten paying attention to ourselves at the expense of others, the Qur'an and our traditions, they tell us to avoid such behavior. To avoid such behavior. On the other hand, we are what? We are encouraged to pursue a life of selflessness. To put the well-being of others before ourselves. To make sure to take care of those around us before we take care of ourselves. To pursue and acquire compassion, to be compassionate towards others. Many of us, unfortunately, because of all of these horrendous, these terrible scenes and news that we hear about, many of us have become desensitized, right? Go on the internet, turn on the news, read the newspaper, and you will hear 10 people were killed here, 50 people died here, this many people died, that many people died, this happened, that happened, and we hear it over and over and over and over, and we become desensitized. So when we turn on the news and we hear that 50 people were killed in an explosion, we say, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raja'un. And then we flip the channel or we go about our business. We become desensitized. We've lost that sense of compassion, that sense where we're moved by other people's pain. Or if this compassion we have or if we are moved, in fact, it is what? It is something that is temporary. It's not real. It's temporary. There becomes a hype on social media, for instance. There's a hype. There's a famous or popular hashtag going around. And we're all contributing to it. But it's temporary. Two, three days, and then phew, it's gone. That compassion is gone. We forget about the incident or the issue. It's not real compassion. It's not real care. We are encouraged to be generous, to be very generous. The Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. For the love of Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein alayhi wa sallam, a second salawat. For the love of Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam, the third salawat in your loudest voices. <laughs> Our Prophet, he tells us that when it comes to generosity, that generosity was one of the characteristics of all of the Prophets and all of the Messengers. And if we read history, for instance, some prophets and messengers, you know, they shared certain characteristics, certain virtues, and some of them, they did not necessarily possess every characteristic. Courage is important, but not all of the prophets and all of the messengers had to display this great sense of courage. No, some of them were prophets who had a very local community, a very small community, and they didn't have to express courage when it came to their community. But the Prophet says one characteristic which was there with each and every one of them is what? Is generosity. The capacity to help others, to turn to others, to help them. This is something that we're encouraged to pursue to help those who are in need. And this is not just financial help, because when we think about
helping others and being generous, the first thing that comes to mind is what? Is money. But generosity in the Islamic tradition is not just about money. It's not just about giving financial help, but it's about giving all sorts of help. Sometimes someone doesn't want your money, they want you to listen to them. I mentioned this last night, I believe. That friends, real friends, are those who will listen to you, they'll hear you out. Sometimes someone doesn't need your money, but they need you to listen to them. Someone, sometimes, some people, they need your advice, they need your expertise. They're looking for a job maybe, or they're trying to, you know, continue their education, or whatever. They're deciding to get married, or pursue a certain career, or what have you. And they want your what? They want your advice. They want your expertise. Give them. Give them. Be generous. Be kind. Yes, you're busy. You have a lot of things going on. But sub, put some time aside to help others. To give them that advice. To help them with those things that they're in need of. Sometimes someone just wants you to smile. They just want to look for a person who's smiling. Some people, and we notice this in our lives. Sometimes you might not be feeling too good, but you see someone who's smiling, and that smile itself does what? It uplifts you. It gives you a little sense of life. And in fact, by the way, even medically, smiling is good for you. Smiling is good for you. Some people, the only smile they know is the emoji on their text messages. Otherwise, they don't know what a smile is. It's good for you. Smile. It makes you feel better. Even if you're feeling down, force yourself to smile. Smile. Because not only will it help you, it will help others also. And so we're encouraged to be kind. We're encouraged to be selfless. We're encouraged to help with whatever capacity that we can do. Our sixth Imam Al Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al Sadiq alayhi salam. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. He says in the hadith, Man qada li akihi al mu'min haja, he or she who helps their brother or sister in faith, helps them overcome a challenge or fulfill a certain need. مَنْ قَضَى لِأَخِيهِ الْمُؤْمِنْ حَاجَةً قَضَى اللَّهُ لَهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ مِئَةَ أَلْفِ حَاجَةً If you help in fulfilling the needs of someone, then God in return, God will fulfill for you 100,000 needs. And this is the Imam. The Imam here, he's, uh, he's serious. 100,000 needs, and then he continues. He says, The first of these 100,000 needs is what? Is paradise. For wholeheartedly helping someone who's in need. If you can help them, help them. We're encouraged to do so. We're encouraged to be selfless. We're encouraged to put the maintenance and the well-being and the security and the comfort of others before ourselves. This is what our leaders and our masters teach us. And this is the only path to success, brothers and sisters. The Holy Quran tells us, You see in Arabic grammar, let me give you a, a very quick Arabic lesson. There's a difference between two negations. One negation is lam. Lam mean. Lam. Mean. And then we have another that is Len, Lan, Noon. What's the difference? Len is a negation that is not necessarily definitive. So if you use Len, if you're saying someone has not come here, Lam Yakti Rajul, the man has not come, that doesn't mean that he's not going to come later. Len, Lan, Mean. If you use len, lam, noon, this means what? It's a definitive negation. Meaning what? Meaning never. So if you say len ya'ti rajul, means that he's not here and he won't be coming. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse, 
He says, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ You will never, you will never attain al-birr, righteousness, حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ Until you give from that which you love. From that which you love, that which you desire. This is real generosity. This is real selflessness. And it's the path to success. Our Imam Abi Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam, he says, Man jada sad, the person who's generous in helping becomes what? Becomes successful. We spend so much time, you know, buying the right clothes, dressing the right way, fixing up our hair and you know our, our, our facial features and getting the nice car and, and you know all of the accessories and all of that stuff so that people will come to us and think that you know we're approachable, we're attractive, you know we might get more friends. We try to do a lot of things in our life that bring people towards us. Our Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam he says generosity will help you with all of that. He says the generous one is the one who is close to Allah, is close to people, and is close to Jannah, the paradise. If you want people to follow you, if you want people to come running after you, be kind, be generous. It's something that people cannot avoid because everyone likes someone who's kind. You don't have someone who says, oh, this person is kind. It's not going to be good for me. It's not a good friend. He's kind. He's generous. No, everyone likes those who are kind and generous. And that's one way to become closer to Allah and to become closer to others and become close to heaven. It's a path of success, kindness, selflessness, altruism. We learn these from whom? We learn these from our masters and our role models, the Ahlul Bayt They were all selfless. They were all altruistic. Never did they put their own personal benefits before the benefits of others. Never. In fact, they always turned towards others, made sure that others were okay before themselves. It's mentioned in a story that one day a poor man, he came, he entered into the mosque of the Holy Prophet and he came to the Prophet who was sitting with some of his companions and he told him, listen, I'm in need of food. I'm in need of food, so please help me. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, he directed him to his home. The home of the Prophet is adjacent to the masjid of the Prophet. So he directed him to his home. The man, he went, he knocked on the door. One of the wives of the Prophet, she opened the door. He told her, he said, I'm here. And the Prophet directed me uh, to come to your home. She went inside the home, she came back. And she told him, oh man, there's nothing in the house. There's nothing for me to give you. This is the house of Rasulullah. Nothing, there's nothing in the house of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon. So the man comes, he tells the Prophet, he says, I went to your home and I was told that there's nothing that can be offered to me. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, he tested his companions. He asked them. He said, who of you will take this man and take care of him? He's a stranger, he's someone who's in need. Who will take care of him? One of them, he got up and he told him, come with me. He took him to his house. He went inside, he told his wife, he told her, we have a guest today, I want you to prepare food. What kind of food, how much food do we have? She told him, we only have enough food for me and you and our two children. So he told her, prepare it all. So she prepared the food, this man, he brought the food and he placed it before this needy man. And the tradition says that he dimmed the lights so that the man would eat comfortably because the food was a little so that the man would not see that he's not eating the host is not eating 
So the man ate. The next morning, they went back to the Prophet's mosque. As soon as they entered into the Prophet's mosque, the Prophet looked at them and he smiled. He smiled. And then the verse was revealed, وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصًا And they what? And they are selfless. They turn to those who are in need. And they take care of those who are in need, even though they themselves are desperately in need. Who was this man? Was it anyone other than Ali ibn Abi Talib ibn Ali Isra? Was this generous woman anyone other than Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam who teaches her young son and Imam al-Hasan she tells him Bunayya ajjar thumma ad-dar the neighbor before the home others before us and these two young boys who slept hungry that night are they other than al-Hasan and al-Hussein alayhi salam this is the end of it Imam Ali alayhi salam one day He's walking with his young servant. Amba was the servant of Amir al-Mu'mineen. And what's amazing is that, you know, the Ahlul Bayt, they would come and they would purchase some of these slaves. They would, and then they would teach them, they would take care of them, and then they would let them go. They would let them go, yet these slaves, these servants, they would turn to the Ahlul Bayt and they tell them, we don't want to go, let us stay. Let us still serve you. Yes, we're not servants, we're not slaves in that sense, but allow us to stay and to serve you. They don't want to go anywhere else. So Qabal is there with Imam Ali alayhi salam. Imam Ali takes him and they go to the market. And as they're walking in the market, Imam Ali goes to one of the vendors and he buys two shirts, one that is more expensive than the other. He takes the one that is more expensive and he gives it to Qambar. He tells him, Qambar, this is a gift from me to you. Qambar, he tells him, Ya Amir al mumini How? How is it possible? It's impossible that I'll wear a shirt that is more expensive than yours. That I take the better shirt. It's impossible. I never do that. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he tells him, my dear Qambar, you see, you're a young man. It's expected that you look presentable and you look good. I'm an old man. I've become old. And this is not important for me. It's not important for me whether I wear an expensive shirt or an inexpensive shirt. Imam Ali alayhi salam is selfless. Is selfless. He looks out for the well-being of others before himself. This is what we learn. This is what we learn from the Ahlul Bayt alayhim This is what we learn from individuals like Abbas ibn Ali ibn Ali. Allahu Akbar. Abbas, there's something about Abbas. There is something about this amazing man, the father and the embodiment of altruism. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, who gave everything he had. Everything. He gave everything he had in order to make sure that others around him were okay. Al Abbas alayhi salam, who was born for the day of Ashura. You know, the hadith tells us that after or at the moment where Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam in her final moments, she gives her will to Amir al muminin She calls him forth. She tells him, Ya Abul Hassan, come forth. Let me give you my final will. Many of the things, she tells him many things. And then she tells him, Ya Amir al muminin one of the things that I want you to do, I want you after I die to go and to find someone to get married to. So that she comforts you, that you don't stay alone. And also someone to be able to take care of our children. Allahu Akbar. Look at this lady. Look at this lady. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, after the passing of Fatima, after her martyrdom, Amir al-Mu'mineen, he goes to his brother Aqib, 
who was an expert in ancestry and in the families and in the clans around, he tells him, Oh, Aqil, I want you to find for me a woman who was suitable for a very important cause. He doesn't tell him, Aqil, go and find me the most beautiful lady in Arabia. Aqil, go and find me the most wealthy lady in Arabia. The one who can cook the best. The one who looks the best. No, no. He tells him, Aqil, I want you to find me a lady who comes from a household of courage. I want someone who has the heart of a lion. Because I'm looking down the road. I want a child that would be helpful when the times are tough. Allahu Akbar. Amir al-Mu'mini is thinking about that day. And how not? The Prophet had told him what was to occur to Imam Hussein alayhi salam. So Imam Ali, he marries Umm al -Baneen. They have four sons. Umm al -Baneen, the mother, which means the mother of the sons, four sons. One of them is Abbas. Abbas was designed for the day of Ashur. He was brought up in the home of Amir al Mu'mineen and Umm al Baneen. Amir al Mu'mineen, the embodiment of courage, the embodiment of bravery. Umm al Baneen, the embodiment of giving. Her entire life, all she did was give and give and give. The embodiment of giving. And out of this union was born Abbas. And he was taught to give. And he was taught to be courageous. He comes, he approaches his brother Abi Abdullah and Hussein alayhi salam on the day of Ashura after the companions had been killed. Some of Bani Hashim had been killed. Abbas approaches Imam Hussein and he tells him, Oh my dear Imam, Ya Aba Abdullah, I ask you to give me permission to go out and to, to fight on the battlefield. Imam Hussein, he looks at him and he tells him, Oh my dear brother Abbas, you're my brother. Abbas, you are my brother. You are my backbone. You are my support. You are my flag bearer. I cannot handle you leaving and not coming back. Oh Abbas, if you go, then who will be left to take care of the women and the children? O oh, Abbas, if you go and you leave, then who will be there to support me? Allahu Akbar. Abbas alayhi salam, he tells him, my dear brother Hussein, please, I've lost my patience, I can't stand here anymore. Watching what these evil men are doing. They've killed everyone. They've killed our companions. They've killed our friends They've killed Ali and Al Akbar. They've killed Al Qasim. They've killed my brothers Allahu Akbar. I don't have any more patience. Please give me permission to go out and To fight Imam Hussein tells him my dear brother Abbas before you go out to fight, I want you to do one thing. I want you to go to the river and to bring some water for these thirsty women and children. Abbas alayhi salam, he tells him, yes, my master, I will do so. Allahu Akbar, brothers and sisters, during my last trip last year to Karbala, I had the honor of visiting Al Abbas alayhi salam and Al Imam Al Hussein. And as I was waiting in order for the time to become for me to go and to perform the ziyarah of Al-Abbas, I sat down and I wrote a few words of humble poetry. I'd like to recite them for you tonight. For this day, for this day, I waited many months to come. For this day, I waited many months to come. Yet Abu Fadl, I stand before you now. I had planned to ask for this and that. I had planned to ask you for this and that. Yet Abu Fadl, 
I forgot it all and instead just sat. Your majesty made my entire existence shake. Standing before the shrine of Abu al-Fadl Abbas. It's a different feeling, brothers and sisters. Your majesty made my entire existence shake. I could not tell if this experience was real or fake. My master, how do I begin to even approach you? When Abu al you are the father of every virtue. So I just stood there and stared at your magnificent shrine. So I just stood there and stared at your magnificent shrine, waiting for a glance from you or even a small sigh. Then I remembered, then I remembered exactly how to make my plea. Then I remembered exactly how to make my plea. Abu Fadl, Abu Fadl, you are the quencher and I am thirsty. Abu Fadl, he tells Imam Hussein, he tells him, yes, my master. I will go out and I will bring the water for these thirsty women and children. Abu Fadl Abbas, he charges forward towards the river bank. He's able to disperse the enemies. Yes, this is the son of the Lion of God. This is the son of Ali Karra. This is the son of the one who was able to lift the gate of Khaybar by himself. He's been trained. This is the courageous Abbas. He is able to break through. He reaches the bank of the river. He enters into the river in order to bring the water. He feels the cold water. Allahu Akbar. Three days, not a drop of water. He's thirsty. He feels the water. And so he feels the water. He is very thirsty. And then suddenly he remembers the thirst of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. He remembers the thirst of the woman and the children. He remembers Sukaina screaming, Al Atayish, Al Atayish, Al Atayish. We are thirsty, we are thirsty, we are thirsty. He, take, he turns around and he fills the water container. Then he turns back towards the camp of Imam Hussein. As he returns, the enemies, they surround him. Umar ibn Sa'ad, he commands his soldiers. He tells them, oh my soldiers, do not allow Abbas to return. You know what happens if he returns back to the camp? Do you know what will happen if he and his brother Hussein they received water? These are the champions of Safin and Nahrawan. These were trained by their father, Amir al-Mu'mineen. Do not allow him to reach the camp with the water. And so the enemies, they approach from every side. The arrows, they begin to rain. One of the enemies, he comes and he strikes Abbas on his right hand. His right hand falls. Abbas alayhi salam in this state, he says, you think that by cutting off my arm you will stop me? I will defend my master and my religion till my final breath. And then another enemy comes and he strikes Abbas on his left hand. In this sense, the water bag drops. Abbas alayhi salam then begins to carry it with his mouth. Imam Hussein is watching. He is watching the flag bearer. He is watching his brother Abbas alayhi salam. And it's if the Imam is watching, looking, looking onto the river and its backdrop, backdrop. Looking onto the river bank and its backdrop, backdrop. Will Abbas the flag bearer, the water backdrop, backdrop. 
The sight of his brother's fall made Hussein's back drop, back, drop, who is now left to quench the thirst of Sukaina. Yay, yay, who is now left to quench the thirst of Sukaina. Abbas falls, and then another enemy comes, and he strikes Abbas, an arrow comes into the eye of Abbas. Another arrow comes and pierces the water bag, it falls. At this moment, Abbas is hopeless. There is no hope for him to go back and to take the water back to the camp, to the women and the children. Suddenly, another enemy comes and strikes Abbas on the head. Abbas, alayhi salam, he falls. He turns to his brother. He says, Akhi, akhak. My brother, Abba Abdullah, I have fallen. Imam Hussein comes rushing to his brother, Abbas. As he is coming, he sees before he arrives, he sees a pair of hands, one on this side and one on that side. He approaches closer and he sees his brother Abbas has fallen, an arrow in his eye, another arrow in his chest. He comes to him, he tells him, Akhi, al-an qad inkasara dhari wa qallat hilati. My brother, I have lost my support now. Who is left to help us and come to our rescue? He comes to him, he sits by him. He tells him, my dear brother Abbas, allow me to take you back to the camp. Abbas, he tells him, no, my brother Hussein, please don't take me back. Allow me to stay here. He tells him, why, my dear brother Abbas? He tells him, how am I supposed to go back to my niece, Sukaina, empty-handed? How am I supposed to go back without bringing the water that I had promised to bring? Allahu Akbar. And this final piece of poetry, it's as if Abbas, he's speaking to his father, Amir al -Mu'mini. He's telling him what he has done. For Hussein, I gave my life. My dear father, father, for Hussein, I gave my life, my dear father, father, had I more blood, I would have given further, further, or another set of hands you'd seen for there, for there, I am Abbas and Hussein is my every breath, I am Abbas and Hussein is my every breath, inna lillah wa inna ilayhi وسيعلم الذين ظلموا آل محمد أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين السلام عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله السلام عليك وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليكم مني جميعا سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى ورحمة الله وبركاته وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات نهدي جميعا ثواب سورة الفاتحة مع الصلوات